Mr. Holmes. A beautiful feather pen of a good make. A membership card for the London Crest Club. This watch is of great value. First of all, let us carry out an external examination. There is an injury to the skull, most probably caused by the fall in the water lily greenhouse. The vessels and the pupil of the eye appear quite normal. The air from the lungs carries a faint floral aroma. Hmm. There are no suspicious marks upon the chest. Let us finish our external examination so that we can proceed with the autopsy. Nothing suspicious here. No redness, stings or bruises. Now, let us examine the internal organs. The heart's blood vessels show no pathological signs. The heart tissue shows no visible pathological signs. The lungs are congested and edematous. The tissue on the inferior lobe of the right lung is damaged most probably caused by toxins from an unknown plant. The liver is enlarged. It would seem that he was suffering from an alcohol addiction. The liver tissue is brown. There are no visible pathological signs. The stomach tissues show no visible pathological signs. There is a small amount of content. It appears that he breakfasted lightly, only a short while before his death. My suspicions have been substantiated. Montague Dunn. The director of Kew Gardens died from poisoning, plant poisoning to be more exact. You mean... Yes, it is murder. We should inform Lestrade. Yes, but do remember, Watson, that I discovered the murder. The challenge is mine. The challenge, Holmes? We need to locate that deadly plant. Such a perfect murder appeals to me. Murder of any kind appeals to you. Is that all we need to do? No. We also have the people working at Kew Gardens, Martin Hamish, and the son of the victim, 
Albert Dunn. And also Miss White, of whom we spoke with Mr. Hamish. Should we bring them all here for interrogation? No. A few innocuous questions at Kew will suffice, as well as a discreet delve into their personal affairs. Yes, Watson. It is time now to open the doors. Even those in the staff building? I suppose that is necessary. We should also be concerned with the victim himself. After all, we don't know very much about Montague Dunn. You're enjoying this already, aren't you? <laughs> More than a little. Mr. Hamish, can you explain to us what happened to the Colonial Collection? It seems somewhat depleted. But, uh, oh, most likely maintenance work, tidying up. You're not sure, then? But you're the Deputy Director. Well, I am busy. I cannot be everywhere at once. As Deputy Director, how was your relationship with Montague done? To be honest with you, Mr. Holmes, it could have been better. You see, every Tuesday he would carry out his inspection of the gardens, but it was solely to make an impression, great pretense that he cared at all. He would give out absurd orders, ignoring anyone else's opinion. He would then disappear for the rest of the week. He was what some might call a man of action. I'd say rather he was overzealous and chaotic. So after all, it was no wonder, perhaps, that he ended up like that, if you take into consideration his kind of lifestyle. You mentioned that Mr. Dunn led a particular lifestyle. Well, it's no secret that he enjoyed, uh, celebrating, shall we say? He was a member of the London Smart Set. He was famous for it. That and... And? He had an eye for the ladies, to put it mildly, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Hamish, can you tell us who holds the keys to the locked greenhouses? That would be Albert, Mr. Dunn's son. Yes, Albert keeps all the keys, and one can only imagine why. What do you mean? Well, he was never interested in Kew Gardens before. And now, all of a sudden, he is trying to act as if he owns the place. 
I think he wants to take over the management here. <laughs> He'd do better to leave that to me. He has no experience. No, none at all. What is your opinion of Albert as a student of botany? He's useless. I often tell him so, and I can only give him cleaning tasks. Botany is not his life's work, and his father well knew it. He was furious about it. He was? Oh, yes. He forced his son to work here, and he never missed an opportunity to criticize him publicly. Are you able to elaborate on that? Well, for example, with our last exhibition here, Mr. Dunn had Albert make a presentation speech. But then, while the lad was speaking, Mr. Dunn interrupted him, asking him difficult questions, making him look like a failure. It was with the intention of making a fool of him, Mr. Holmes. That must have been terribly humiliating. Yes, he was crushed and he had to leave. Everybody was making fun of poor Albert. That is, except for Miss Margaret White, who is such a nice lady and who always takes pity on Albert. You mentioned a Miss White. Would you tell us more about her? She is a student who works here part-time. She is quite charming indeed. She possesses a great talent for botany. You should take a look at some of her experiments that she carried out in the laboratory. Ah, if only she were not so naive. Why naive? The way she used to flutter around Mr. Montague Dunn. And he... why, he couldn't help but be flattered by all her attention. How could an intelligent woman such as Miss White not see through his game? I can only scratch my head and wonder. Now tell me, Mr. Hamish, do you grow the more deadly variety of plant here? You mean insectivorous? Yes, but nothing larger than that. Are you aware of the Divine Syndicate? The Divine what? Is this a joke? No, I am quite serious. What a ridiculous name. Anyway, I have never heard of this syndicate. Thank you, Mr. Hamish. We shall continue our investigation. Locked. Who is Miss Margaret White? Ah, she is the young lady who studies with me. She visits here sometimes to help out with the greenhouses. In fact, she should be here today. She wanted to work at the seed house. That's the small greenhouse across from the large glass house. We noticed that a part of the colonial collection has been cleared. Ah, at the moment I'm just dealing with the storage room. I don't know much about the other rooms. I imagine that your relationship with your father may have been a strained one. Yes. I cannot say that he was a kind man, for he never listened to me at all. He forced me to work here. But now, after his death, I've been pondering it over. Perhaps he wasn't so wrong about me after all. I have to follow his path, and I have to manage Kew Gardens, and I can do it. I can be as good as any other who works here. Would you please tell us about Martin Hamish, the Deputy Director? Well, I have to tell you that Mr. Hamish is not and has never been the deputy director of Kew Gardens. My father would not have tolerated it. Indeed? Well, that is most interesting. He told us that he was. Yes, because he believes that the management should be passed down to him now that my father is dead. But in actual fact, Mr. Hamish only has the honour of being the garden's longest-serving employee. In fact, if we are to think logically at all, it should be me who takes over the management of Kew Gardens. Do you not have a good relationship with Mr. Hamish? I suppose so. But we have very little in common. Mr. Hamish loves his plants and Kew Gardens, and I cannot say that I share his passion. I see. 
And how was his relationship with your father? Oh, he hated my father. It was obvious. He would be furious whenever my father boasted of Kew Gardens in the newspapers or at conferences. He was convinced that my father was stealing all of the credit for himself. But my father treated Mr. Hamish in the same way as he treated anyone. Dismissively. With indifference. Tell me, have you ever heard of the Divine Syndicate? No, I cannot say that I have. Do you hold the keys to all of these locked doors? Yes, you can have them. But I cannot give you the keys to the cloakroom. The employee's effects are private. I am sure you understand. Thank you, young man. We shall see you again soon. Newspapers discussing Kew Gardens. photograph of Montague Dunn and Reynold Hamish. <laughs> 